Welcome back to the lab. Welcome back to E for everyone. <laughs> oh, I didn't finish what I hoped I would. Let's talk about that. If you've been following along with the motor series, then you know that we're designing an awesome motor controller. One that looks a lot like this. My intent is to make this mostly plug and play. Plug in a motor, add a controller, hook up all the controllers, and boopity boppity, you've got a motor that you can talk to over Modbus or Serial. I can see the concept really coming together here, but there's really only one problem. I'm trying to write some software. Now, I don't know if this is a Ryan thing, if this is a software thing, or if I just have a lot left to learn, but software can be a little more, I don't know, finicky, frustrating, tedious maybe. What I mean is you can get something 80% correct in about 20 minutes and then take the next four hours to figure out why it doesn't just quite work exactly how it needs to. As you can see, I'm definitely in that latter half, that longer stretch. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself though, so let's paint the whole story. A few videos ago, we had code that was working with Modbus it, in a library compatible with the Arduino IDE. I didn't write that code. We also had a different Arduino project that was able to run closed loop control in a motor. And this is all in C++. Great. Now we have our new board. I picked a micro that has a little more computational horsepower. So now what? Well, the compiler for these chips doesn't support C++. Only C. Great. Now I'm off to find a Modbus library that supports being written in basic C instead of C++, so I'm not porting this from one to the other manually. The biggest problem here is that I found too much information. No, really, the number of times this problem has been solved is staggering. I think the GitHub search results for Modbus sums this up pretty concisely. 6,532 results for the keyword Modbus. Yeah, I spent a lot of time trying to find the right reference code a lot of it didn't work for me. I was just trying to get my bearings in the protocol and understand what's going on. They do have official documentation, by the way. Free for everyone. Read it. It's awesome. Link in the description. After a while, I found a project from a guy that was in the same circumstance as me. They found all the libraries. None of them integrated nicely into their code, and they decided to mash all the references together into something that worked for them. Lucky for me, they ported it onto a PSOC 4. Nice. This is where some of the nuances of the PSOC 4 ecosystem me in the butt, and they're worth talking about. There's actually different flavors of PSOC 4 devices. Some have programmable analog, others have programmable digital, and others still have both digital and analog programmable blocks. Unfortunately for me, the soft cores that this other person was using are great. They have like a TX enabled, it's hardware driven, and it's awesome. They use the programmable digital blocks, so they're not compatible with my chip. <sighs> I only have the analog blocks. Thankfully, I had enough PSOC development kits laying around. Uh, yeah, that I found one and this dev kit has the right cores, has the right features, so I could build it and put it on this chip even though it wasn't exactly the same, it's just in the same product family. So cool, I ran it, the code works great. Now comes the hard part. We need to make this code, instead of working on the chip it was designed for, we need to make it work on a different hardware UART peripheral that can't even generate a hardware-driven TX enable output. After a fair bit of doing, it works, sort of. I keep receiving extra bytes filled with zero zero, and I have no idea why. I hooked up this board, no extra data, hooked up a general left TDI header, no extra data. It seems like this thing is working correctly. But I don't know, I think it's something to do with how Windows is sending each packet piece by piece, and there might be some small delays that are getting interpreted as extra serial messages, but I have parity enabled, so I don't know how that's even possible. <sighs> Naturally, I did what any self-respecting hardware engineer would do in my situation. I added a terrible one-line hack that will probably live in the code forever. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I added a check to throw away bytes that read zero, which is awful because we need to accept zero as a valid number. How am I supposed to set a register to zero if zero is forbidden? This would only work with a Modbus ASCII, which is less efficient, and I'd really rather not use it. Okay, great. We can receive messages now. Uh, sort of. Let's test the packet parsing logic. And of course, Everything failed. CRCs are failing when they were passing on the other chip, even though I can verify the registers and data going in are exactly the same. So yeah, all right, 
I give up on Modbus, I concede, at least for now. And I made a couple diagrams to summarize exactly what I learned. By the way, I do intend to publish this code as a library when I'm done, add one to the pile, and it should be compatible with just about every processor that can run C and has a function that is called when a byte is available. That should run on pretty much every device known to man with or without interrupt-driven UARTs, so yeah, it should be universally compatible. Awesome. This describes the logical process that the microcontroller does to receive Modbus packets. It all starts with a receive data loop, where each byte is added to what is probably a packet, and once the code decides that the packet is complete by some means, either parsing the packet or waiting for a timeout, then it starts by verifying the address is correct, followed by verifying the CRC is correct, then interpreting and responding to the function code as the host would expect. I penciled in a couple function codes and error codes into this block diagram that I think will apply to the motor controller prototype. There's more in the protocol. Just in case I forget everything that I learned between now and when I finish writing this code, I captured everything into what looks more or less like a UML class diagram. This just outlines the different variables, data types, and functions that I expect to be required to serve the purpose of Modbus interpretation. Where, of course, by functions, I mean the gross, basic, like straight C version of object-oriented code. I can't use methods or ob objects, anything like that, so it's, yeah, it's a little gross. To summarize, my goal is to create a new library that has one header file and one .c file that you can just include and call functions from that will make Modbus work. I don't know how, but it seems like everyone else in the world has decided that making people include and stitch together six or 12 files is more convenient and intuitive for the average developer. Again, I'm just the stupid hardware guy. I'm sure they have a reason for organizing their code like this, but... It was hard to get working. Okay, uh, time check. Guess it's time to move on. Right, so I wasted all my time trying to make Modbus work, only to then remember that I still needed to make a video and release it. Yeah. I want to give an extra special thank you to our channel members on Patreon and YouTube, and especially to our editor. He's been muscling through some not ideal footage lately, and he's been doing a great job. You'll keep this big ball of awesome rolling downhill at ever-increasing speed, and ever-increasing size. You know what I mean. Thank you. Now, I had more code to port from C++ to C, but this time it was at least my code, so I understood it, and it was a little bit easier. This is the motor controller code, and once I was done with this work, we have... whatever this is. Good news, I can tell it's trying to regulate position, Bad news, it can't seem to decide to change direction without me bringing the wheel to a complete stop by hand. I've seen similar faults before. This could be as simple as needing to decrease the control interval, like making it update the control loop more often. But yeah, there's going to be a lot of debugging required here, and I ran out of time for this week. We are really, really close, though. The motor is spinning, encoder feedback is happening. All I need to do now is make it work. In the sense that success is often a series of failures, this was a great step in the right direction. I have a path to getting Modbus working, more to come on writing our own library there. We have a control loop code that is running, probably running. Hmm. More investigation required there too, but I'm all about sharing the process of how to design and build something like this. And like it or not, this is a part of that process. Integration is tough. Coming up next, we'll be writing a Modbus library and fixing this controller, and I'm really excited to see this project come together. As always, I'd like to give a special thank you to our channel members on both Patreon and YouTube. I really appreciate the extra step you've taken to support us directly. I'd also like to thank you all for your support through viewership, comments, sharing what we do with others, those who choose to watch ads, and those who are subscribed. It has been awesome and humbling to watch this EE for Everyone community grow, and that just can't happen without you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye! Mm. Mm, I don't like that. <sighs>